we often at the start of the year will do these introductory um, sort of introduction to socialist politics type talks and discussions. Um, I decided to structure mine this year around the ABCs, which seems like a good idea, but it has posed some, look, I've tried to structure it in a way that makes sense, but it may, and it, I think it starts off strong, it may lose structure a little bit towards the end, but that's fine. Um, and it also means, so with this talk, I'm basically going to be introducing a lot of different um, concepts uh, and not going into the into huge detail on any one of them, really. So it's going to be more of a broad than a deep talk. And then whatever elements of it interest you or whatever you have to contribute, or if you've got questions, then feel free to throw those out in the discussion. Um, cool. So to start off, ABCs, we have introducing capitalism. So A is for alienation. Um, so if we consider one of the basic building blocks of society is how we produce and distribute the things that we want and need. So the stuff that you need in order to produce the things that you want and the things that you need to keep society going, like the land and the resources and the tools, are called the means of production. Um, capitalism is a system where the majority of people are alienated from the means of production. So they're separated from it. Um, we don't have ownership or control in practical terms over the land we stand on, the places we work, um, the things we produce, or our own labor. So there are very few areas in life where we can assert democratic control over our lives. Um, this has all sorts of practical implications, which we'll touch on in more detail in other sections, um, but it also has cultural implications. So alienation is a good starting point for us here in Aotearoa because um, here the process of alienation meant the process of colonization. So in Europe, the birth of capitalism meant the closure of the commons and the coercion of the peasantry into out of their traditional lives and into capitalist production. In Aotearoa, it meant the forceful removal of Māori from their land and their way of life. And so then robbed of their land, Māori people were had no choice but to sell their labour for a wage, competing with the new settler population. So capitalism also alienates us from each other. Uh, loneliness, cultural disconnect, feelings of powerlessness and despair, hostility, fear, resentment, these are all some of the cultural ramifications of alienation. Um, B is for bourgeoisie. So, uh, so much for the have-nots under capitalism. What about the haves? Uh, so capitalism is not the first or the only society to have a ruling class, but the specific ruling class that emerged with capitalism is the bourgeoisie. So these are the people who own the means of production, the land, the factories, and so on. So the bourgeoisie began to emerge as a class sometime around the 11th century from the class of artisans, craftsmen, merchants, and they came into prominence around, obviously, the Industrial Revolution. And over time, they reorganized society to fit their needs, so overturning monarchs, displacing the aristocracy, restructuring government, introducing parliamentary democracy, and changing ownership laws. Uh, as the needs of capitalism developed, the bourgeoisie embarked on imperialism, war, and colonialism to expand um, their economic activity around the globe. So C for capitalism. So we have capitalism, um, a system where the means of production are concentrated in the hands of a small number of people, and the vast majority of people have to sell their labor in order to earn a living. Everything produced um, under capitalism is a commodity. This could also be C for commodity, um, which is so it's made solely to be sold for profit and then that profit reinvested in order to produce more commodities in an endless cycle. Um, an endless churn of growth is necessary because each capitalist is competing with other capitalists. And if they do not stay ahead, then they won't survive. So there's a need to be constantly revolutionizing, constantly growing and producing more. And the result is a chaotic, unplanned system driven by profit and ravaged by periodic crises. So this could also be C for crisis. Um, and here we've got a little illustration, a cartoon from the industrial worker in 1911 showing the different classes in um, capitalist society. So here's the bourgeoisie here. 
Um, all right. So D E F G H, we have introducing Marxist thought and Marxist politics. So D for democracy. Um, so because it's based on private ownership, capitalism is deeply undemocratic. So the private ownership of wealth and the means of production puts most the most fundamental workings of society outside of the realm of democratic control. The capitalist state too allows um, a sort of a limited amount of democracy. So at best we are allowed to vote for representatives in parliament, but that still leaves a huge part of the running of society in the hands of businesses and unelected bureaucrats. And the state is not neutral itself. It's not only sort of bribed by businesses, but it is itself enmeshed in the capitalist system and is invested in maintaining it. Um, so Karl Marx said that the history of all heretofore existing societies is the history of class struggle. So as long as there have been underclasses, there have been rebellions and uprisings of the underclasses. Um, when socialists think of democracy, this is one of the first things that we think of. So what the Russian revolutionary Leon Trotsky called the direct intervention of the masses in historical events. And our vision for a democratic society is one where democratic control is extended to all areas of life, including those shut off from democratic control now, namely production and distribution. Um, so this brings us to E for Engels, and this is me cheating because obviously you want to talk about Marx, but he's too far down the alphabet, so we're talking about Engels. Um, so in 1848, Friedrich Engels and Karl Marx, um, I'm not going to talk very much about them as people, sorry, but we can get into that maybe more in discussion. But the important thing is that they published the Communist Manifesto, and it's important to not to think of this as um, this totally new moment, this totally new invention that came out of nowhere with this text. So Marx and Engels were working within an existing movement, looking at protests and uprisings and organizing that was happening and debating and refining ideas. So one way to look at the Communist Manifesto is that it kind of unites several strands of insight. So the fact that there were working class uprisings and there were a vast number in the time that they were working, and that there were people who were theorizing the potential for a better society and what that might look like. Um, but those theorizing and advocating for better societies were often utopian in that they were seeing these changes as coming from above. Marx and Engels united the two ideas, that there could be a better society and that it could come about through the struggles of the ordinary people themselves. Um, so that brings us to F for France and the French Revolution, specifically the Paris Commune. So this is um, a historical example that Marx and Engels took inspiration from. So it was a French revolutionary government that seized power in Paris um, from 18th of March to the 28th of May in 1871 during a time of military conflict. So the commune governed Paris for two months, establishing a progressive democratic rule that included the separation of church from state, self-policing, the remission of rent, the abolition of child labor, the right of employees to take over an enterprise deserted by its owner. Um, the Paris Commune operated on a principle of universal suffrage, and all elected leaders were accountable and recallable at any time. So until its defeat, and you can see the barricades there in that photo, which they're defending themselves with, um, in May 1871, it was an example of what true democracy could look like. The Commune had shown ordinary people organizing democratically to decide their own destiny, and it showed that workers' uprisings weren't just battering rams to get rid of an old regime, but that the very process of struggle involved democratic organizing, and it could change people and open up new possibilities, and that's going to be a theme of this talk. Which brings us to G for gravediggers. All of this is why, so the revolutionary potential of the working class is why Marx said that capitalism creates its own gravediggers when it creates the working class. So H is for history. So what role, what is the role of socialists in the broader working class movement? So that's a really broad question and there's lots of different tacks you can take on that. Um, so I'm going to talk about it in terms of history. So um, the Russian revolutionary Lenin described it as acting as the memory of the class. So the socialist movement at its best is a thread that runs through movements for human liberation, connects the past to the present, preserves the lessons of history for the next generation. 
um, as well as connecting different struggles in the here and now. So socialists provide a special perspective on history, that it's something which is a process. So it's something that's dynamic and it's created from below. It's not just created by the sort of the great men of history books. And instead of seeing a sort of a linear march of progress, we see history as a contest. Um, and socialists don't see historical events and processes as inevitable. We look at the victories and defeats of the past and we say things could have been different. And so we look at the present and the future and we say things could be different. So that's the socialist perspective on history. Um, so, yeah, um, I for internationalism. So in the Communist Manifesto, Marx and Engels said, workers of the world unite, you have nothing to lose but your chains. Um, and the workers of the world unite part is not just a pretty sentiment, but it's an important part of the socialist project. Um, so being internationalist means believing that the workers of different countries have more in common with each other than they do with the ruling class of their own countries. And that to be successful, a socialist revolution or a socialist society needs to cross national borders. Um, we push back against the idea that there is such thing as the national interest, which sometimes requires one to put aside other loyalties and aspirations. So we oppose wars and we support freedom of movement on this basis. Um, so the internationalist tradition, this is why we're called the International Socialist Organization, um, is also opposed to the undemocratic regimes of the former Soviet Union and so-called communist China currently. So we identify these not as socialist or communist societies, but as state capitalist regimes. So the ruling classes of these countries have also exploited nationalism as a way to exert control over their own populations and to justify invasion and subjugation of other populations. Um, Stalin in his time even explicitly dropped the concept of international revolution in favor of a new approach of socialism in one country, as he called it. Um, uh, so, yes, it's um, to clarify as well in a sort of a small note here, while we don't support the USSR, we do still look to the Russian Revolution of 1917 as an important moment in socialist history. Um, so in the discussion and certainly in future sort of talks and discussions and things, we'll talk more about the, yeah, the 1917 revolution, the defeat of that revolution and what that kind of means and how we interpret that. Um, but just, yeah, just flagging that now. Um, so that brings us to J for justice. So another important part of socialist politics is a commitment to overcoming all of the oppressions faced by different parts of the working class and other oppressed classes. Um, and overcoming divisions and prejudices within the class, so racism, sexism, homophobia, transphobia, being a tribune of the oppressed is one of the tasks that we are supposed to take on as socialists. Um, and among the rights that we champion is the right of nations to self-determination, which perhaps seems at odds with the internationalism, but it isn't. Um, workers, the workers of the world can only unite when workers of one national group are on equal footing. So it can't happen on the basis where one national group is being oppressed by another. So uh, different groups can only unite on the basis of equality and freedom of association. All right. So on Marxism and women's oppression. So this is K4 Kolontai, Alexandra Kolontai, um, who was a Russian revolutionary. So earlier in the talk, um, I talked about how our society is shaped by how we organize production. Equally important and inextricably linked to this is how we organize reproduction. So the having and raising of children, their education, how we reproduce ourselves each day through food and rest um, so that we are ready to work again the next day and sort of caring for the sick as well. All of the things that are done to ensure that our society carries on into the next generation. So Alexandra Kolontai um, was a socialist who contributed to our understanding of how this work is organized under capitalism and how it could be organized under socialism. 
She, like many before and since her, recognised this question is deeply tied up with the question of women's oppression and women's liberation. So a quote from her is, she says that capitalism has placed a crushing burden on women's shoulders. It has made her a wage worker without having reduced her cares as a housekeeper or a mother. So Kalantai's life and political works show some of the ways that these questions were taken up in a particular historical moment during the Russian Revolution. So in the immediate aftermath of the revolution, many policies were enacted to transform the social and economic status of women, including women's suffrage, um, reformed laws around marriage, divorce, and property, um, legalized abortion, and also practical measures like communal facilities for cooking, cleaning, and childcare. Um, in 1918, after the revolution, um, Jinotto, the women's section of the party was launched and that was headed by Kolontai. All right, so L for Lenin. So um, he's obviously another figure from the Russian Revolution um, and a controversial figure. So his legacy was taken up and sort of distorted by Stalin and by the USSR. Um, he was deified in sort of really ghastly ways um, sort of not even allowed to be buried, sort of stuffed and put on display um, in this ghastly way. And his name was appropriated by Stalin to name his new sort of um, distorted brand of Marxism, which he called Marxist-Leninism. Um, but Lenin himself as a historical figure can teach us a lot. So Lenin, um, in my opinion, he sort of models the way that um, theory and practice ought to go hand in hand. Um, to examine one of his sort of theoretical insights in greater detail, he talked about the importance of a revolutionary workers' party. So early in his political education, Lenin came to reject individual terrorism and the actions of small groups to bring down tyrannical regimes. And he looked instead to the working class to liberate themselves and saw mass uprisings as the way to bring about these sorts of changes. Um, but he also understood that spontaneous working class rebellion, while it was powerful, was not enough on its own to confront the power of the capitalist state. Um, and he knew that the work, workers, working class had to be organized politically as well as practically. So he championed the importance of having a political party that was by and for workers, through which they could give leadership to the wider class and wage battle in the political sphere. Um, so this would be a party that would bring together sort of politically active workers into this sort of leadership role. Um, rather than, so it, it operates in quite a different way from the, the bourgeois political parties though. So rather than relying on a passive membership and support base, it would be a democratic body that sought to mobilize its memberships in struggle. And rather than replacing protest and industrial action and sort of um, mass uprisings on the street, with kind of action through the parliamentary system, the party would draw on and amplify mass struggles. So it would be the two, the two realms kind of operating side by side. All right, so that brings us to M for the metabolic rift. So this is talking about um, capitalism, socialism, and um, the environment. So I, I think that one of the things at the heart of the socialist project is the relationship between people and our environment. So um, Marx himself wrote about this relationship, referring to it in terms of a metabolism. So the relationship between us and our wider environment is like the relationship between different cells in a body. Um, so Marx in particular talked about soil and the way that industrialization had disrupted the interchange between people and the soil, which led to a crisis of soil fertility, which is a, a story for another day. Um, so in contrast, in societies where people have an unalienated relationship to the land, it's not that mistakes can't be made in the management of the land, but there is a direct feedback loop. So the consequences of people's actions on the land can be observed and their responses can be altered. Um, all over the world, including in Aotearoa, we have seen the devastating impacts of severing people's relationship with the land and losing the knowledge that people have when they have an intimate relationship with the land and control over how they interact with the land on their own terms. Um, so socialists bring some unique perspectives into the fight for the environment. Um, I think that three of these major ones are 
One, that the drive for profit is the thing that is driving environmental destruction. Um, secondly, that our relationship to the environment is a collective one. So we need collective action in order to save it. Um, and three, that the solution is bound up with justice and democracy. So what we posit is that a dem democratization of society and re production towards need rather than profit, um, and which would allow us to also think about the needs of the environment rather than just the needs of um, human beings, would help to restore that feedback loop and heal the metabolic rift that has us sort of spiraling towards uh, environmental catastrophe. All right, so in this section, um, it's talking about some of the activities that we do in the here and now as socialists. So um, in for newspapers. Um, so one of our focuses is our publications. And there is a, a proud history of socialist magazines, newspapers, um, which I won't bore you with, but it is a, it's a common theme of the struggle. Um, so for us, we've got the magazine, the Socialist Review, the website, our newsletter, Tide. So socialist publications document workers' struggles and the struggles of the oppressed in ways that mainstream publications don't. Um, and as well as documenting history and uh, current events from a socialist perspective, um, we attempt to analyze things from that perspective and to sort of bring socialist politics to a wider audience. Um, and to sort of provide a small um, antidote to the skew in um, the mainstream press. And if we don't do these things, then who will? Um, so we try to connect uh, individual issues to the bigger questions of systemic injustice and oppression and to bring the histories of the lesson into the present, so on and so forth, and make connections between different political issues and struggles that are happening. Um, always for organizing. So we join in with campaigns that further uh, the cause of justice and human, human liberation. Um, and one of our goals is for all of us who are involved in this to be confident in all the various skills associated with organizing. Um, something which characterizes socialist politics is a particular perspective on the relationship between ideas and action. So in order for action to be successful, People need to be actively thinking about tactics and strategy and drawing on the lessons of the past. And then, of course, the ideas themselves are only useful if they are being tested and refined in practice. Um, so, and another sort of core tenant of socialist politics is that struggle changes people. And that it's through organizing for our own interests and actually having a chance for once of taking part in democratic debate and decision making that people can kind of feel the capacity that they have to have an effect in their own lives and on the wider society. Um, peers for protest. So we take part in a range of different activities, but there are some that we prioritize over others. So we favor actions that bring together as wide a group of people as possible, um, that encourage people to organize for their own rights and that confront institutions that have power. So for us, um, protests and rallies and demonstrations have a few different things going for them. So there's one, obviously there's the immediate effect of sort of hopefully achieving some of the desired demands and goals of the protest. There's also winning support for different causes, hello, um, by making them visible to more people. And then there's also the kind of the psychological and emotional effect of coming together with hundreds of other people and bringing regular life to a standstill. So it's these situations where the idea of collective power actually feels real. Um, and yeah, in these, in protests on the picket line and things like that, your allies and the people who are with you and the people who are against you sort of become more clear. Um, and at Q, I'm going to use queer rights as an illustration of this kind of activity in the here and now. So there's a long history of socialist involvement with LGBT struggles. Um, to give an example of uh, a sort of a recent example, um, so members of the International Socialists and other socialist groups 
We're among the founding members of the queer protest group called Queer Endurance Defiance, which came together in 2021 to organize a protest against a transphobic speaking tour. Um, and in doing so, they open up important political debate and discussion as others felt that protesting the event was too risky and that the best uh, response would be to go behind the scenes and ask the venue to cancel the event or things like that. Um, so, and I think that the protest that QED organized, which went ahead, is makes a good case for the protest approach. So the transphobic event went ahead, um, but any attendee who went had to be confronted with this large crowd of vibrant, chanting queer people and their supporters. And they had to see that their hateful views are still very much in the minority and that people were willing to mobilize to show their opposition. And then for the people in attendance, for the trans people in attendance, they got the chance to have the bolstering experience of standing with hundreds of people who support them and sort of reclaiming that space that the transphobes were trying to take and being able to speak to the people there about their own experience rather than just having themselves talked, having to hear themselves talked about in the media, often with these sort of transphobic talking points setting the terms of the discussion. All right, so R for revolution, and we're zooming through a bunch of the, you know, the, the awkward letter half of the alphabet. We're having a talk on reform or revolution next week, so this will be like quite a sort of once over lightly, and we can revisit these in more detail. All right, so a revolutionary situation is a moment where two or more competing political forces struggle for power. So as socialists, we are interested in the moments where the anger and the hope of decades mobilizes the mass of people onto the streets to confront society, to confront their rulers. So we believe that this is the scenario that has the real potential to transform the world. And we believe this because we think the fundamental dynamics of society need to be changed and that the ruling class is not going to simply hand down these changes from above. And we also see the potential for transformation in these moments um, because, as we've sort of touched on throughout this, um, the experience of revolution has a profound effect on the people who participate in it. So in mass up uprisings, people are forced to take control of their own destinies in a way that they haven't before and to collaborate and organize democratically. Um, S is for uh, social revolution. So um, you can divide revolution into different types. A political revolution transfers power from one section of the ruling class to another, um, or from, say, a military government to a democratic government or vice versa, um, but leaves the basic social structures of society intact. Um, a social revolution is more far-reaching. So a social revolution is where a new class rises to power and transforms society. So a socialist a revolution would be a social revolution of the working class to organize society in their interests. And um, I don't think I included it in the end, but I just wanted to make the point as well that um, revolutions are, are not uncom uncommon. There are sort of dozens that have happened in the you know, the past couple of decades alone. Um, uh, do, 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 do. T for tyranny. So do revolutions always end in tyranny? Um, the short answer is no. Um, so when you look at the mass uprisings happening today, for example, in Iran, the democratic spirit of these uprisings is obvious. And where we have seen repression following revolutions, this is most, most often the result of the defeat or the counter-revolution against that uprising. So we could look at Egypt after 2011, for example. Um, so I think it's, it's convenient and sort of hypocritical for opponents of revolution to argue that they always lead to tyranny when historically uh, we have had examples like Chile in the 1970s where a popular uprising with huge democratic potential was violently put down and a tyrannical dictatorship was installed by the US. So we believe that these uprisings need to be supported and 
even in the face of potential defeat, and precisely because the defeat of these movements can have such devastating consequences and can lead to repression. Um, U is for utopia. So another um, misconception is that socialist societies come out of the brains of socialists. Um, this kind of thinking is often called utopian. Um, so I would say that we are utopian in that we believe in the potential of humankind and we all have an impulse in us to try to make the world a better place. Um, but we're not utopian in that we think that we can simply impose these ideas from above. So a socialist society would come about democratically through struggling and organizing of the masses. And in the very concept of democracy, there isn't the idea of perfection, but of constant change and development as ideas are tested and debated. Um, v for violence. So we recognize that violence is part of the system that we live in and it's a fact of day-to-day -day life. And we recognize that violence is and will be part of the struggle against the system. So people tend to conflate revolution with violence, which is not accurate. So the act of the mass of people rising up to assert their rights is not inherently a violent act, but we know that it will be met with violence. So we see this on a similar scale, on a smaller scale, even with our sort of more day-to-day -day political activities. So any time that a strike or a demonstration gets too large or too destructive, there's inevitably a crackdown from the police or security, et cetera. So it's just a recognition of the fact that if a revolution is ever going to be successful, the state needs to be confronted and disarmed, that there is going to be conflict involved in that. And I think um, I think a line from the Internationale, one of the anthems of the socialist movement, I think kind of sums up this, atti this attitude quite well. It goes, um, no more deluded by reaction on tyrants only we'll make war. The soldiers too, too will take strike action. They'll break ranks and fight no more. And if those cannibals keep trying to sacrifice us to their pride, they soon shall hear the bullets flying. We'll shoot the generals on our own side. So I think that kind of sums up the sentiment quite well. Um, w for workers' power. Um, so I talked a lot about this already, um, but it's... To put it in more practical terms, in a struggle that has that it's disruptive enough to shut down the various forces of um, society and operations of society, it then becomes necessary to start those back up again because the workers themselves who are protesting, who are organizing, still need food, water, education, health care. And so historically, we have um, a lot of great examples of workers who have managed to shut down a particular city. They've managed to occupy a particular place, um, forming democratic bodies to tackle these um, practical and political tasks that come with uprisings. So you had the Soviets in Russia, you had the Cordones in Chile, you had the Shoras in Iran. Um, here is Antonio Gramsci in 1920 describing workers of Turin who were occupying all of their factories at that time. He said, it is really necessary to see one's, with one's own eyes old workers who had seen broken down by decades upon decades of oppression and exploitation stand upright even in a physical sense during the period of occupation. See them cre develop creative activities, suggesting, helping, always active day and night. It was necessary to see these sites and other sites in order to see how limitless the latent power of the masses are and how they are revealed and developed swiftly as soon as the conviction takes root in the masses that they are the arbiters and masters of their own destinies. Um, a more contemporary example, you could look at the 2011 occupation of um, Tahrir Square in Egypt. Um, so... Uh, Protesters set up more or less a self-contained community occupying that square during that uprising against the dictator. So food, water, and medical supplies were organized by committee and dispensed. Um, another committee produced a paper providing the latest updates in the square and what was happening outside. 
Um, people came together to clean the streets and to sort of show that they could take care of their, of their neighborhood and of their space. Um, there were, and yes, amazing sort of like democratic gains were made in this space. So despite a history of tensions and conflict between Coptic Christians and Muslims, in the square in this moment, they stood arm in arm and defended each other's prayer sessions. Um, and you saw women taking on an active role in public life in a way that they hadn't been able to in recent history. Um, and X for X, yeah, I'm sorry, for expropriation. Um, what else was I going to put there? Um, so socialists are for the abolition of private property. And it is worth clarifying what that means. Um, which handily Marx and Engels did uh, in the Communist Manifesto, addressing the sort of imaginary capitalist who was reading the manifesto and, and um, objecting to it. So they say, you are horrified at our intending to do away with private property, but in your existing society, private property is already done away with for nine-tenths of the population. Its existence for the few is solely due to its non-existence in the hand of those nine-tenths. You approach us, therefore, with intending to do away with a form of property, the necessary condition of whose existence is the non-existence of any property for the immense majority of society. Communism deprives no man of the power to appropriate the products of society. All that it does is deprive him of the power to subjugate the labor of others by means of such appropriations. So by private property, we mean the means of production. We mean property that is used to generate profit, property that is used to compel others to have to work for you for a wage. So it's not personal property like your house or your toothbrush. Um, and challenging private property is, you know, it's not really so radical. Um, the Greens have recently proposed that private property should be open to um, treaty claims. And this is a great example because it kind of points to sort of one of the alternatives to private property, which is the concept of communal ownership, which, you know, has existed here not so long ago. All right. Why is for you? Uh, yeah. So uh, join the socialists. Um, there is, yeah, there is a lot to be done and everyone brings, you know, their own skills, their own knowledge, their own insights to the struggle. So Y is for uh, we want you to join the socialists. And Z is for um, uh, Clara Zetkin. Um, so she is another inspiring socialist. She's sometimes called the grandmother of German socialism. So she joined the Socialist Workers Party in Germany in 1878 and was, an acti was active in the socialist movement until her death in 1933. So an extremely long career and she did a lot of amazing things that I don't have time to get into, but seeing as she is Zetkin with a Z, we will end with a quote from her. So she says, where there is a will, there is a way. We have a will to world revolution. Therefore, we must find a way to reach the masses of the exploited and the enslaved women, whether the historical conditions make it easy or difficult.